Hey guys, I'm Tomas. This is Maciek. We are both from SolarDB. Uh, we are working on a project called Sol Operator, which is a Kubernetes operator for a high-performance NoSQL database called SolarDB. And we are <laughs> this is going to be better. Uh, cool. Uh, so why would you want to run your uh, database on local versus network attached storage, right? Like you get a higher throughput, you get a lower latency, you get higher IOPS, and you don't have to replicate your data twice, once for your network attached storage and once as a replication factor in your DB. And that all means you get a lower cost. The downside is it is harder to manage. Uh, so as a show of how close you can get to a VM performance for your database, I took one of our performance runs, which has three nodes, runs 60,000 IOPS uh, against it. And if you look at the read latency, the P99, you can see that the AVS1 running on EC2 instances, just a regular install of Scylla, takes 2.2 milliseconds. The EKS1 is just 2.9, and our new dev versions are still getting closer. So you can get very close to VM, if not the same performance with Kubernetes. Uh, so how do you get that local storage in Cube, right? So there's a feature called local persistent volumes that is GA since 114. It's essentially a better version of a host path uh, with the difference that the scheduler is aware and will always place your ports on the same node contrary to a host path solution. Also, it's more secure because you have the PVC versus PV split, but you need to introduce a special handling when the node dies because your port is bound to that storage. Uh, the way to get this local storage is by using a storage class with a waste for first customer, consumer volume a binding mode, which essentially makes the scheduler being topology aware. Uh, the downside is there is no dynamic provisioning of those persistent volumes in Kubernetes. That said, there is a local volume static provisioner that does, as the name says, the static volume provisioning only. It's provided by six storage but it's out of the tree, so you have to manually deploy it and configure it. It works by watching a discovery point on your file system and creating a persistent volume for each entry. Uh, it also handles the PV lifecycle, like shredding it when you need to recycle it. Uh, to set it up, you have to create a daemon set that reconfigures your node devices for that discovery point, uh, either by mounting a static disk partition or the whole disk, or you can use bind mounts with per-created directories, but you get no quota for that. So you want to run this in the cloud, right? And we did as well. And it turns out not to be as easy. So <laughs> with GKE, uh, when you upgrade the GKE cluster, it starts replacing the VMs and provisioning new ones with the new version, which means it throws your local storage away, which kind of sucks, right? Uh, you can prevent that uh, ge with general Kubernetes construct, which is called for disruption budget. So we can say only one of them can be down, but GKE auto updates decide to break that contract after one hour, and streaming takes time, right? If you have terabytes of data for your database, it may not make it in time for that one hour. So you have to fall back to doing manual upgrades with GKE. Uh, some may say like you need to account for node losses anyways, but the upgrade frequency is so much higher than what you would expect your node loss frequency to be. Uh, the other issue with GKE is you get the disk as a file system, which may not be the file system type your database needs. Say Scylla needs XFS and GKE will give you X4, so we have to reformat it and make sure it doesn't get reformatted back on every boot, so there's a bit of hex that you need to do. And the state for EKS is very similar. It again replaces the whole VMs with a new version, which loses your local storage. Uh, it has similar timeout issues as the GKE. This time it's like five to 15 minutes. Uh, so you again have to handle the upgrades manually. So maybe replacing VMs is not a great idea when you are using the local storage, right? So is there a way out of this? And Yes, there are other distributions like OpenShift or OKD, which is the upstream version, that do in-place upgrades, which means you still get the same VM and the same local disk you had before. It uses RPM or 3, 
file system that's immutable and does Atomic switches to a new version, so you don't have to stream your data to a new node at all. Uh, you also get the same cube distribution everywhere, and it's not hard, that hard to manage because the platform is managed by the operators, but I'm sure there are other options for you as well. And now Maciek will tell you about dynamic provisioning. Yeah, so let's talk about dynamic persistent volume provisioning for the local storage. So currently there are only two available options. Uh, there is a local static provisioner Thomas talked about earlier, but unfortunately it only supports static provisioning, so manual actions are needed. And there is also a CSI host path, which provides you with dynamic provisioning, but unfortunately it's not feature complete. It supports only a single node and it's not production ready, but it follows a modern CSI approach. And the CSI stands for the Container Storage Interface. Uh, it basically allows the third-party storage providers to expose their block and file storage systems in a pluggable way. And it is implemented by multiple container or orchestration systems like Mesos and Kubernetes. And actually on Kubernetes, uh, when you write such a driver, you don't need to touch any Kubernetes code whatsoever because um, Kubernetes provides you with several building blocks that are basically running as a sidecar to your driver and they are managing everything Kubernetes related for you. And uh, writing drivers for network attached drives is kind of different to how you write them uh, for the local, dri local drives. Uh, so for network attached drives, you usually run uh, a couple of controllers uh, where you select a single one using leader election to manage the lifetime of a, a network attached drives uh, via some external API. And when the pod uh, lands on the node, uh, the node has access to this drive, drive uh, via network, and it can just mount it uh, with a pod. But for local drives, uh, it's kind of different, because as the name suggests, the local drives are only local to a particular node. Uh, so for example, driver running on node A cannot create a directory on uh, the disk attached to node B. So we need to think about it, and you, your driver needs to and to not react on a request not bound to the uh, node the driver is running on. So you need, to, you need to distributed provisioning for that. There is also another constraint that uh, appears here. When you're using a different, uh, local drives, the different nodes might have a different storage capacity, and scheduler needs to know about it because it shouldn't place a node that it's not going to fit into a node. So the way to do it is to inform the Kubernetes scheduler by creating the CSI storage capacity objects, uh, which basically uh, scheduler understands and uh, take it into consideration when it filters out uh, the nodes that are able to fit the pod. And there is also a use case, which is not very common for network attached drives. So when you are using local drives, uh, you have some different problems. Like, uh, you might want to influence the scheduler decision based on, on your custom internal weight function. Like, for example, maybe you want to uh, fill your disk to 100%, so you might prefer to choose uh, the node with bigger free space. Or maybe um, your disk is really great at reading, so maybe you, will, uh, you want to collocate the reading workloads there. So the way to do it is to write a scheduler extender running alongside the Kubernetes one, and uh, suggesting your preferred choice of a node. So to sum up, the dynamic provisioning in Kubernetes, uh, there is no out-of-the-box solution currently, although there are uh, building blocks available. And uh, so if you need uh, this kind of storage, uh, you just need to deploy your own driver, which is fairly easy to do it, uh, thanks to these building blocks. So thank you very much. Uh, we are here at the after party, so if you have any questions, uh, make sure to uh, catch, us, catch up us there, or maybe uh, you want to drop us an email or visit us on Slack. And if you are uh, interested in writing Kubernetes controllers for low latency applications, we are hiring. So thank you very much. Thanks.